Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago Auditorium. In order to ensure a pleasurable and safe experience at this afternoon's presentation, we ask that you listen attentively to the following safety announcement. In the unlikely event of an emergency, we ask that you make your way in an orderly manner towards the nearest exit. These are located to the rear of the seated areas of both the main house and the balcony levels. Please take the time now to identify these exits. Once through these exits, proceed left or right towards the staircase using the emergency exit, which is the same as the exit from the auditorium. Do not use the elevator. Once in the staircase, use the handrail and keep moving downwards to the ground floor, where further instructions will be given by the bank's security personnel. In light of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Central Bank Auditorium is committed to keeping you safe while at the theater. We therefore ask that you practice good hand hygiene by making use of our sanitizing stations located adjacent to the elevator entrance on each level. We thank you for your patience and attention as we all do our part to avoid the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Please enjoy this afternoon's presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago. I am Janelle Spencer, an economist here at the Central Bank, and I will be one of your hosts taking you through the proceedings this afternoon. So we will be having a panel discussion on re-engineering the economics of Carnival for sustainability, following which you will be entertained with a cultural presentation crafted by creative director Marvin Dalridge under the artistic direction of Wendell Manwagen. But before we begin, allow me to introduce you to my co-host, Mr. Kevin Finch, who is the manager of Central Bank's research department. He's gonna give you a little perspective on why Central Bank chose to highlight sustainability and economics of Carnival during this, our 2023 research review seminar. Kevin. Thank you, thank you, Janelle. And good afternoon, everyone. It's indeed a pleasure to welcome those here in the auditorium and those joining us via the live stream to this year's panel discussion, which focuses on, on Carnival. I'm particularly pleased that we have with us here uh, student representation from a number of secondary schools in Port of Spain and environs. Now, this is in keeping with the bank and our department's efforts to expand the tentacles of our outreach. We firmly believe that youth involvement is critical, particularly in policy discussions on matters that are likely to affect them in years ahead. Now, some persons may say the topic of carnival is off the beaten path, especially for a central bank that generally focuses on more hardcore macroeconomic issues. However, for those that follow developments at the central bank, we know that we are vigorous supporters of the culture and arts. The bank possesses one of the largest collections of local art in the country, some of which is on display in the lobby, if you would have seen um, on your way in. We also support the preservation of vintage Calypso through our collaboration with Tuco, and more recently, our intake of two creative residents attached to our museum and auditorium for a period of one year provides a career launchpad for those involved in the creative arts. But the question remains, why is the research department of your central bank interested in carnival? Like many of you, we have endured the seemingly perennial discourse that carnival needs to be more sustainable, but with little evidence of any meaningful advancement beyond the discussion phase. So as time progresses, we have witnessed the demise of what used to be staple events and the rise of a new genre of carnival-related activities. As economists, we can surmise that Carnival suffers from a number of structural issues, many of which oscillate around its financial viability. Over the past few years, as a bank, we have been focusing our research efforts on structural reforms, and that is the needed changes to the institutional and regulatory framework in which businesses and individuals operate in order to enhance economic outcomes. For example, in past events, we have focused on issues such as small business development, as well as digital transformation. The call to advance structural reforms have also become a mantra of sorts in our 
various economic publications. Again, we come back to the question of why. Because structural reforms, alongside sound monetary and fiscal policies, are imperative in Trinidad and Tobago is to achieve sustainable economic development and growth. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the ultimate objective. Now, we didn't trick you into coming here to hear economics lecture, so I will perhaps stop here, because I know you're anxious to get into the, to the discussion. So, um, Janelle, could you let us know who are our panelists this afternoon? Thanks for setting the stage, Kevin, and grant me a few more moments so that I can introduce you our very capable, pa capable panelists. So first, my left to your right, we have Dr. Keith Nurse, who is the president of COSTAT. Dr. Nurse is a former principal and the CEO of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College in St. Lucia. He is an expert member of the UN Committee for Development Policy and a former senior economist and advisor on structural policies and innovation at the OECD in Paris. He is the former World Trade Organization Chair at the University of the West Indies, where he also served as the Executive Director of the UE Consulting Company. Welcome, Dr. Nurse. Next, we have Ms. Denise Hernandez, the Secretary at the Central Executive of Pan Trinbago Inc. Prior to this role, Ms. Hernandez's extensive experience in the education sector led her to being appointed as the president of the Association of Principals of Public Secondary Schools and serve as the board director at the Association of Supervision and Curriculum Development in Washington, D.C. Her perspective is further heightened by her direct involvement in culture, having been a side stage player specializing in the triple guitar for the Massey Trinidad All-Stars, as well as in her capacity as a committee member of the Tasso Youth Steel Orchestra. It's great to have you with us, Ms. Hernandez. Our third panelist, Mr. Jerome Prasia, best known in the entertainment industry as Rome, is a former mechanical engineer holding a master's degree in engineering asset management. Mr. Prasia now wears many hats of a radio host, TV host, artist, and actor. Most recently, he co-founded a radio station, Lit 102.3 FM, and is currently serving his second consecutive term as a president of the Trinidad and Tobago uh, Promoters Association. This unique blend of experiences has molded him into a an charismatic and prolific leader in the entertainment industry. Your perspective will be invaluable, Mr. Priscilla. Next is Ms. Carla Cupid, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Tourism Trinidad Limited. Ms. Cupid is a dedicated management professional with over 20 years experience in both the private and public sectors. She has been instrumental in the successful execution of projects we all know, such as TDC's Domestic Tourism Stay to Getaway campaign in 2016. She has also done the development and content management for the destination's Go Trinbago Tourism app, and also conceptualized and developed the Carafesta 14 app, to name a few. We look forward to your contributions, Ms. Cupid. Our final panelist is Jules Sobian, who is the founder and CEO of event management and production company Caesars Army Limited, as well as the creative director of Rogue Mark Band. Mr. Sobian has over 20 years experience in building, managing, and championing brands, and has successfully launched many brands, such as Caesar a Creative, Antillier, Cesar and mass movement over his very long career. He has become a key architect in the advancement of the local and the regional entertainment landscape and also lends his expertise in a host of boards, including Napa, TTT, and the Inter-American Development Bank, NextGen. Thanks for joining us, Jules, which brings us to our moderator. And I'll invite Kevin to come back and introduce our expert moderator, Kevin. Thank you, thank you, Janelle. Uh, the success of any panel is highly dependent on the acumen of the moderator. And to guide us through this afternoon's discussion, um, I'm confident that we have someone that is more than qualified to manage this high-powered panel of speakers. This person is no other than Ms. Carla Paris. Ms. Carla Paris is an entertainment and sports lawyer with a master's degree in entertainment and intellectual property law. She's a board member of the Inter-American Development Bank Next Gen Board, a web and TV series producer, and an intellectual property law academic. Her career has been quite untraditional, as after being called to the bar in Trinidad and Tobago, she made the decision to move to London, UK, to explore her ambitions in the creative industry. 
There, she worked in the magazine publishing industry as an editor and features writer to various magazines within the cultural and entertainment sectors. After returning to her TNT, she worked briefly as an entertainment news journalist. Her company, Paris Productions Limited, produces a web and TV series, The Business of Carnival, which is an educational talk show featuring Caribbean celebrities and well-known entrepreneurs, which the legal and business aspects of the carnival industry are discussed. The series is currently streaming on Roku channel and all Roku devices across the US, UK, and Canada. For over a decade, she has operated the first boutique law practice in Trinidad and Tobago, whose focus is in an area of entertainment, intellectual property, and sports law. She provides creative sector development consultancy to governments and businesses and business development strategy to clients in traditional corporate industries and in the music, carnival, film, sports, and broadcast industries on a variety of copyright and trademark matters. Some of her clients, past and present, include renowned cricketer Dwayne Bravo, the government of Trinidad and Tobago, the OECS Commission, the World Intellectual Property Organization, and the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee. Much like her father, who is, I notice, I recognize in the crowd, Mr. Carl Paris, one of my favorite lecturers, if I may add. Uh, she's also actively involved in academia and has been a guest lecturer in the film department of the University of the West Indies and taught intellectual property law in conferences across the Caribbean for organizations such as the OECS Commission, the Caribbean Court of Justice, among others. I'd also say that, I mean, personally, I have known Carla since secondary school, but I wouldn't say how long that has been uh, to spare our ages. But I, I know Carla for a long while. I know that she's more than able to guide us this afternoon. So without further ado, let me hand you over to Ms. Carla Paris. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our discussion today about Carnival. And thank you, Kevin, you know, for inviting me and for the panelists, you know, in, in at such a forum where the bank is really interested in exploring more about this topic. Um, I'm going to ask Kevin, you know, just keep me up to speed in terms of the time because we have a lot to say and, you know, I, I don't want us to go overboard because we have a whole cultural presentation and cocktails and so on afterwards. But um, I just wanted to kind of frame the conversation to say that when many of us think about carnival, we're thinking about the fets, we're thinking about the fun in the sun, we're thinking about going to steel pan yards and all of that. And that is great. That is one aspect of carnival, and it's a major aspect, but that's not all there is. Carnival is actually an industry. It's a sector. It's an ecosystem made up of a, a variety of people whose goods and services contribute revenue to our economy. In fact, it contributes substantial uh, foreign exchange. And some of these people are band leaders, costume designers, event producers, steel panists, um, and so on. And then when you think of the logistical aspect, we have the people who drive the trucks. They're involved in the deco. They are involved in all of the logistical aspects, the behind the scenes that we don't see. And then, of course, we have the people involved in food and beverages, and then the hoteliers, to name a few. And the thing is, although all of these people, as I said earlier, generate revenue, what is quite disturbing is that there are income sources that are not being tapped into and not understood by these creatives themselves, by government agencies, and um, even by legislators. And that's what we are here to discuss. We are here to sort of drill in and as much as we can give you some key takeaways on how Carnival, the products of Carnival, can be long lasting. Because many people have said, well, what is sustainable? It means that we're not going to be figuring out every year, step by step, what this product looks like. We're going to have policies, economic policies, legislative policies, and just sort of a map as to how we can move forward. And this conversation, we're not intending to give you all of the answers because we don't have them, but we're intending to have uh, just a starting point. So having said that, I want to lead into uh, the panel discussion and to start with a question of the definition of carnival, because although we are tasked with the responsibility of figuring out how do we re-engineer carnival, 
The question is, if we're going to re-engineer the sustainability of Carnival, do we even have a clear definition of what Carnival is for us? And to kick off the conversation, I want to start with uh, uh, Dr. Keith Nurse and get his perspective on what exactly, how would you define Carnival? Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much, Carla. And it's, it's great to be here at the Central Bank. And so I'd like to also thank the Central Bank for inviting us to participate in this, what I consider to be a really important discussion. Um, and, you know, it helps us to refocus the issue on, you know, so what is Carnival and what, what why would a central bank be interested? So I'll answer that in part. Uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago Carnival is a festival. Um, festivals have a particular modality to them, which is that uh, they tend to be at a specific time in the calendar um, when there's a heightened sense of excitement around the deployment and the enactment of particular art forms. And in the case of Toronto Tobago, we've invented many of these art forms. So Toronto Tobago Carnival is very much a path breaker. So that, you know, we invented the steel pan. Um, the various genres of music are all invented here. Um, it is possibly the most indigenous product or service or form of intellectual property for Toronto Tobago. Um, so many other sectors of our economy largely run on other people's technologies, other people's ways of doing things. Uh, in the case of, of Carnival, this is our own and we've exported it. So Trinidad Tobago Carnival also has the, the, the honor of being the most globalized carnival but, and also the most globalized festival. There are more replications of Trinidad Tobago Carnival than of any other festival on planet Earth. I don't know if Trinidad Tobago as a population really understands this, but um, it's a huge resource which we are still yet to tap into. The other key thing is that Trent Tobago Carnival is um, one of the highest um, festivals in terms of its participation in the domestic context. Um, Trent Tobago Carnival is not just Port of Spain Carnival. There are 50 to 55 carnivals happening in Trinidad, all at the same time. And uh, in that regard, the level of participation by the domestic population, whether they're in the street or whether they're at home watching it on television, means that it is in the top three to five festivals in the world in terms of national participation. Um, what else I would add to that is that really, festivals are important to generate cultural confidence. Um, so, you go anywhere in the world and people ask you where you're from, you see from Trinidad and Tobago, the first thing that pops into their mind is our oh, carnival. Uh, so it really generates a sense of you're part of a larger uh, ecosphere and, and global uh, community. But from an economic standpoint and from the perspective of a central bank, Trinidad and Tobago Carnival is one of the major sources of earnings in the creative sector and particularly generates a lot of foreign exchange from what we call festival tourism. And so from that standpoint, it's of real importance for a central bank to understand how we document this particular um, activity, the festival, but also how do we advance its interests so that it can expand and generate more foreign exchange, more employment, more trade, et cetera, et cetera. I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you very much, Carla. Okay, great. I appreciate that, um, that really thorough analysis in terms of what Carnival is and the whole question of, of festival tourism. So, Rome, I want to bring you in here as I ask the question about defining Carnival. Because we know, just as you know, Keith said, we have all these spin-offs of Carnival all over the globe that, that really and truly uh, started with us. So, if we are to say what Carnival is for our island, how, how would you describe that? I mean, um, Mr. Nurse kind of summed up a lot. <laughs> he left little for us, to <laughs> which, I, which I admire, and which I appreciate, because the way you explained it there kind of would have touched on a lot of the details of our festival. What I would add oh. 
to what he has said is just to differentiate our carnival from other carnivals. Because I know whenever I travel the world and I mention Trinidad and Tobago, and they say, hey, y'all have a carnival like Brazil Zone. Right. And there's a very, very sharp line that defines our carnival from theirs. And our carnival is one of participation versus one of a showcase in Brazil. Now, we have both a showcase and we have participation. So when you go to Brazil, it's more about the floats and the samba schools and the dance versus here, the average tourist could come to Trinidad and Tobago and purchase their own costume and be a part of the carnival and a part of the revelry, where there you sit in the stands and you look at the show. And one, one thing that, that uh, Mr. Ness mentioned as well is that we have exported our carnival. Mm -hmm. And that is different from any other festival around the world. Yeah, you may have EDM festivals and music festivals, but our carnival is very, very unique and it has been replicated. And we have been contacted, I've been contacted personally by South Africa, where they want our carnival across there. Mm -hmm. And people have asked, how can they tap into our carnival and replicate it. They, I had a full conversation, proposals were sent and all of that, where they want to bring in people from Trinidad and Tobago to South Africa to teach their people how to create our carnival across there. Mm -hmm. Now, and this is where Central Bank and these, these, these entities and these discussions are important, is because are we really tapping into all of the revenue streams from exporting our carnival? Now, we have created this thing we, from slavery days to now, our carnival has evolved into a revenue generating entity. Outside of friends and families visiting um, Trinidad and Tobago, this is probably the number one foreign exchange earner in the cultural sector, in the tourism sector as well. So we give our carnival away to other countries and we give them the benefits of earning from it but what do we get in terms of exporting our product? Because yes, we may have promoters who go out there and have fets and carnival bands who partner with other people to do it, but is there something that comes back to Trinidad and Tobago to say, well, this is our product? And I don't have the answer for that as to how do we own our carnival and how do we benefit from the earnings that our carnival generates all over the world? Another aspect of that is a lot of the world is not educated as to where their carnivals originated from. So Carla and I went on a trip um, to Rotterdam to see their carnival, well, to meet with the people who put on their carnival. And some of the people who were there didn't know that their carnival actually originated from our carnival. And they thought it came from Curacao and from those islands, not knowing that when I did the research on their carnival, it was students who lived in Curacao who came to Trinidad's carnival and saw what was taking place and took it back to Curacao and then took it back to Rotterdam for them to have the carnival. So when you trace back most of the roots of carnivals around the world, it came from right here. But are we tapping into all of the benefits of us exporting the product itself? And Rome, as you talk about the benefits of exporting carnival and whether we own carnival, that's a brilliant segue into my next question, uh, because I mean, we are here at the Central Bank and we are trying to understand how do we re-engineer Carnival for sustainability? And one of the areas that allows for sustainable growth is that of intellectual property. So oftentimes when we're talking about revenue from Carnival, we think of things like how much are the fats making? You know, uh, how many people are coming to Carnival Calypso tents and that type of thing, the tangible products. But another sort of very real area that we can earn from are things like the licensing of the carnival costumes, the royalties generated from the, the soca music, uh, the chutney soca, and that type of thing. So I want to bring you all in now to this aspect of where do you see the role of your organization in relation to driving revenue from intellectual property? that's generated for Carnival, because with IP, we could generate what is called long-term sustainable wealth. So I want to bring Jules into the conversation, because Jules, you wear so many different hats. You know, um, as band leader, your event producer, event architect, as I know. Um, you know, you like 
preferred to be to be called based on all the work you've done over the years. So where do you see the role of your organization in relation to driving revenue from IT? Um, from a Caesars Army perspective, based on events and festivals, um, I think the most important part of what we do is exporting the culture, as what Jerome would have highlighted, right? And it's not exporting the culture wholesale. I'm actually exporting parts of the culture. So I export a lot of music in terms of my festivals. I also export the food. I also export the whole meshing of our Caribbean people, whether it be domestic, meshing with territories such as New York, mm -hmm. Canada, UK. And one of the most important things about exporting the culture is that the culture itself needs to understand how important it is. I never thought that I would have been in a position where I would have been an agent of exporting the culture. Never thought that. In fact, when I was young, I was just like, oh, the biggest thing for me was to get into Carnival. And when I finally got into Carnival, I was in Panorama Semis, actually. That was my first semblance of an entity. And then I actually went on the road with my own band for Juve. And lo and behold, after immersing myself into the culture, I was able to create a formula based on my experience and export it. And I exported it from domestic to regional mm -hmm. and then regional to international. So when you speak about IP and what is the culture, I think it's important that the country, its stakeholders, understand how important it is to the world mm -hmm. and how we can take it even further than where it is right now existing, even further to the world. Protecting that and understanding that, because we all understand, even with my dealings with Carla as an IP uh, consultant, protecting intellectually is kind of expensive. Mm -hmm. It's expensive, and you actually have to learn about it, because through trial and error, you would understand that when you put out brands or when you put out music, there are infringements all over the world, as Jerome would have clearly identified that people have basically taken a blueprint of our carnival, and that's responsible for carnivals all around the world. How do we protect that? So I think from a Caesar's Army perspective, I can tell you definitely that with the understanding that soca can be taken to the world, imagine the next generation of soca, whether you call it New Calypso or whatever term it becomes, it is important for the next generation to understand how important the culture can be taken to the world and how you protect that personally. So Caesar's Army is just an agent mm -hmm. pushing the music, etc. And then there's another side of me, um, Caesar, which is like a network hub, a network for next generation creatives. Because what I've understood is that when I was going through my process of becoming an entrepreneur, becoming a cultural um, and creative in the industry itself. There wasn't much to guide me in terms of how do I do this? How do I export from domestic to international, etc. So it's important for me now when I'm looking at the next generation of creatives and cultural, cultural and creative industry stakeholders that there needs a form of mentorship, there needs a form of guidance to actually understand what they are building themselves towards because no longer are you thinking that your brand is something for whom, but you are actually building an international brand for yourself and you need to protect it from early. And as you talk about building the brand and sort of understanding intellectual property, I mean, Jules, you are correct. So with your particular events, you know, we would have discussed, you know, the concept of trademarking, many of your event names as you go from country to country. And that is a form of intellectual property because when you export uh, certain pets, People, you don't want someone in a foreign territory then riding off of your goodwill and riding off of that name and all the effort that you've built, you know, your brand has built to then uh, fool people into thinking that they're coming to an event that actually is not theirs, and you it's, know? And it's very real because throughout my journey, I would have been like, what? Ambush England? <laughs> Where did that come from? Yeah. You know, because... You have to remember that what we have is so unique and so powerful that there are people looking on all the time, all the time and what you're doing and what everybody is doing in terms of the carnival here and are just trying to replicate it. 
And this started off as one conversation with Carla to a number of conversations with Carla based on brands that you're building as TNT that are just being swept and taken away after years and years of building something. So there's a need to protect what is important. There's a need to protect what you're building. And all I can say is that the culture is so important, so integral that the government, the stakeholders, the stakeholders of the carnival itself need to understand the importance of it from a global standpoint. I want to bring in Pancho and Bigo into this discussion because another, I would say, a really integral aspect of, of our, our carnival culture and what makes our carnival unique is the whole, is the fact that we created the steel pan. This is ours. We invented it. And the question of intellectual property uh, with regard to the steel pan players, the arrangers, all of that, I mean, I want to get your perspective, Denise, on where do you see Pantra and Bego, uh, what, what is their role in relation to sort of driving revenue from this instrument? Okay, good, good afternoon, everyone. In terms of um, driving revenue, we see it both from the intellectual property perspective and then also from sustainability. Now, re-engineering Carnival, we had, when we came into office, we looked at re-engineering the first part of Carnival, one part of Carnival, the panorama concept. Usually the Carnival season is January, February, March. But with the growth of the steel pan, a national instrument, we found that our panorama competitions could not hold inside that two, three month period. So we looked at the fact, why pan has no season, and as such, why are we restricting ourselves to having the panorama competition only between January and March. So if some of you may recall, in 2020, we took the bold step and re-energized re <coughs> the panorama by breaking it into the four categories. So now the panorama season starts in November and we go to the end of March, basically. So our first category, the single pan, they now run, have their competition in November, start to end. What we found is that for many persons, Single pan bands are not the known bands. It's more the big bands, the large bands. The old stars, the renegades, the desperados. But that first year, people were amazed at what the traditional or the single pan bands could do with music. And particularly when they are using our own local music for their renditions. So we had that, comp that competition now spans some in November month. Then we have what we call the small conventional bands. So they start in December and would finish somewhere in January. Again, people were amazed. These bands exist, the quality of music. Our youths are going to school, they're going to UTT, they're going to UE, they're coming out with their degrees in music. And if you all notice this year, we had a plethora of young arrangers coming into the, organ the competition. So we have now a small conventional in that aspect, December into January. When we have medium, and large January, February. But in previous years, the medium and large final used to be the Saturday night before Carnival. And people would complain, we have a long drawn out show because it's 20 bands. So we took the bold step and moved the medium finals to Tobago. Economics, revenue generation, yes, because not only for the organization, but for the island of Tobago. Because thousands of supporters go across to that finals. So the people of Tobago were able now, the hotels, the guest houses, food, people, the sea bridge, the air bridge, everybody, revenue generation. For the players, for many of the players, some of them have never been to Tobago, but the aspect of going there. And then now we have the large as a standalone. But with all of that, one aspect that really help us re in this re-engineering is the 21st century technology because now we can stream live from our pan yards. So every preliminary competition, every pan yard, we go live every night. So people can stay here in Trinidad, in the region, abroad, and watch what is happening. And it has generated interest. So that now we see ourselves, we see the fact that the panorama is now becoming even more viable, more economically viable in terms of revenue generation all over. 
in terms of intellectual property, the fact that we are realizing that the music, now a lot of our music, people come, the visitors, they tape the bands, they go outside there and it's played over and over and really nothing comes to the steel orchestras. But rightly so, in terms of our music, in terms of our productions, because every finals is a production in the Savannah, and then the bands themselves put on productions because you, you know now, no final, it's just a plain thing, it's a show. And the bands come in their uniforms, the fireworks, the activities that go along with it, the dancers enhance the music. So we now need to, as IPO says, license all of this so that it generates revenue for the bands, for the organization, for the country, for the country as well. So the fact that we are now going into the IPO and we are hoping that over this next year to get that information down to our band leaders, our young players, but we feel more importantly, it should be in schools. Because if we really want to re-engineer what we're doing, then all that is associated with it should really start in our education system. And we think that really in the schools we need to start talking about this and as we make the changes, we re-engineer. So basically that's where we see IPU. It has no, to I, come I, in I, I because of that fact. I understand um, where you're coming from and I remember in some of our earlier discussions, you were saying that um, some of the things that were, that were bothering you at Tantum Bego, the stuff like, you know, you all would be preparing the the um, steel pan players would be working hours upon hours to come up with these, you know, various arrangements and songs and so forth. And you'd go to pan yards and have events and you'd see people with their phones sort of just taking out their phones and live streaming an event. And that is a form of, well, not only is that, of course, intellectual property infringement, but it's deriving, depriving the rightful holders um, from, from the revenue. So I'm glad that you talked about the question of getting into a better understanding of the licensing schemes, because that is where we are going to be able to generate revenue uh, from the steel pan as we grow. And of course, I talked about education. I'm a big advocate of education uh, in primary schools all the way up, because that is the way that we're going to be able to really kind of understand how we are going to earn from music, from film, from steel pan, beyond the performance. Um, I want to bring uh, tourism into this discussion now. Carla, um, I would love to get your perspective on what we've been talking here about, you know, intellectual property and sort of generating revenue in new ways for the country uh, with the position that you hold. So what, what's your perspective on all of this? Thank you. Um, my perspective on on all that has been said is that from from a from a tourism point of view, what we do in terms of marketing the destination destination Trinidad is really telling the stories. Listening to Jews, listening to to um, Rome and Denise as well. What you're hearing is that they are coming up with with products. Yeah, products and experiences that from Tourism Trinidad's perspective can be used to market the destination. And the cultural, um, the creativity of Trinidadians, Trinidadians and Tobagonians, that is really the vehicle that we're using to spread the message, the gospel of destination Trinidad. Uh, focusing on, on, on Pantron Bego's efforts. Um, what we look at in terms of visitor arrivals and so on is to address that seasonality, the peaks and troughs and so on throughout the year. Carnival is responsible for 10% of our visitor arrivals for the entire year. Yeah? Uh, that is measured over a 19 day period. So you have that peak in terms of visitor arrivals. But what you're trying to do, and, and, and I think Dr. Nurse touched on it, is really replicate that impact throughout the entire year. So it's, it's good news to us, and we, we work closely with Pantron Bego as well. It's good news to us to hear that Carnival is not just Jan to March or February and March. 
it is now being extended in terms of the events and activities because it's so potent. Eh? It's now being extended from November. You had World Steel Pan Day. You had National Steel, Steel, Steel Pan Month for August. So you're now creating these events and activities that really enhances the, the viability of the destination. It enhances the attractiveness of the destination. Having said all of that, if we are collectively exporting our culture, if we are collectively taking pan to faraway places, taking events like what Jews would have to faraway places, yes, Tourism Trinidad is interested in using those events to tell people, hey, you want some of this? Come to Trinidad. But the IP part of it, in terms of securing what belongs to us, mm -hmm. that needs to be addressed and addressed urgently. Uh, because we don't want to, 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 to be part of, um, yes, telling people to come to Trinidad, but you know, people are out there really um, infringing, as you said, on what belongs to us. Because part of what we do, and we, we did it for Carnival 2023, is really tell our stories. Mm -hmm. Carnival, I, I, I would boldly say, and I think Dr. Nurse said it as well, yes, it is exported and so on, and people go to Atlanta Carnival, they go to, um, they go to Notting Hill, and, and, but there's no experience like a Trinidad Carnival experience, what you get here. And because of that, I think it's important to let people know listen this comes from here that's why you know when will steel pandy was 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 proclaimed by the un um i i i was really happy because people so, there are some people out there and i've heard it you know they speak to where steel pan didn't come from yeah right um but it belongs to trinidad and tobago yeah so i think it's important for us to really broaden the scope of how we measure the revenue generated from carnival um, tourism data when you're talking about carnival it speaks to the usual suspects visitor arrivals visitor expenditure and then expenditures broken down into accommodation entertainment etc cetera, etc cetera, tours and, and and transportation and so on but there's a broader and wider ecosystem that we really need to be cognizant of because you want to measure re what is the real real um, revenue generated from this thing called carnival so that is my my perspective on it yeah and as you're using the word measure, I can see Keith Nero sitting right up. Because <laughs> that, if nothing else, that is what is, that word is synonymous with his very being. And I would love to bring him in here because he has a wealth of knowledge about the measurement of data. And, you know, because we're talking about how do we create an economically sustainable product? So we can't create a sustainable product unless we understand how it's working unless we have statistics, we have figures. So could you just enlighten us in terms of what, how do you think we should be doing this better, you know, for the persons in the audience, for the development banks that are in the audience and for central banks themselves who want to understand how is this data going to move the needle? Oh, thank you very much, Carla. <laughs> and Carla. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let me try and hit the needle on the head very quickly. So first off, you cannot manage anything that you can't measure because you don't know if you're doing better this year than last year or 20 years ago. Um, and in a modern economy, you know, we talk about, we live in the knowledge economy and the knowledge age and so on. If you're actually not collecting data and capturing data on something that is so important to us, it means basically you're being left behind by the world. Um, and in that regard, I mean, I've been doing research in this area for, uh, must be like 25 years. So um, I could tell you that we, our capacity to measure is worse now than it was 20 years ago. Worse now. It is worse. All right. So back in the good old days, the, um, the Central Statistical Office used to do a, a, um, 
a publication called the Carnival Digest. And it used to be published every year. It was the most and the best source of data on festivals anywhere in the Caribbean. And then they had a fire at the central statistical office and a change in staff, and that was the end of that. And uh, it took a number of years before the tourism um, ministries and, um, and even the central bank started collecting some of this data. But for a number of years, we went without no institution collecting the data on Toronto Tobago Carnival. So it means then that for, in a strange way, we all cherish this thing called Toronto Tobago Carnival, but we're not investing in it not investing in it from a strategic standpoint because in effect, we view this as an event, as a party, as a really good time, but not as an industry. Um, so if you apply an event focused approach, which is what most of our institutions do. So the, the bulk of the funding that goes into Carnival is spent for the event. It's not spent to build an industry. And just to put things in perspective, we were spending at one point in time almost as much in Trinidad Carnival and some other festivals, because Trinidad has a lot of festivals, as Canada was, except that Canada was investing in boosting the artists, um, facilitating their trade, and ensuring that they generated income from intellectual property. Which country is, has moved ahead? Canada, of course. Their artists have become global. Um, and they generate a lot of foreign exchange for the economy. The case is the same for Trinidad and Tobago, except we don't know exactly. What we do know is this. Festival tourism, which the other caller just spoke about, um, accounts for, and this is data I have for 2020. Uh, so in 2020, we generated just over $400 million TT in terms of visitor arrival expenditures. That's about 60 million US dollars, thereabouts. Um, and even that is a, what can be considered an underestimate. So let's say if we include repeat visitors. So I have friends from Barbados that come for a band launch in July. Then they come for our next one in September or October. Um, then they come to Trinidad for big fets and so on in late November, early December. And then they come back for three or four times before Carnival. All right? So that's not counted in the data that we are capturing in terms of um, visitor arrivals for Carnival. It's only for a very narrow period, 21 to 19 to 21 days? 19 days, 19 days before Carnival. So that doesn't capture all of the other um, earnings. So let's say it's about 100 million US dollars. That's festival tourism. And then the earnings from people like Jules Sobian and his Caesar's Army, who are exporting their services outside of Trinidad and Tobago, we don't know because, you know, when we try to ask people like Jules, so how much do you earn? <laughs> um, you know, they start to shuffle a little bit. Um, you know, I even heard David Rudder and several other artists refer to me as Dr. Nurse. We don't want to hear, talk to you at all, right? <laughs> um, so the earnings, particularly exports of goods, exports of services and in, income from intellectual property, particularly copyright, um, is by and large not being captured, except in copyright from royalties for music. So that tends to be another um, three to five million US dollars. All told, I would say the creative industries is generating, this is our early estimates from several years ago, somewhere between 50 to another 100 million dollars US. So you know you're talking about 200 million US. Um, if you then add the impact of what we call media value, which is what does the, the carnival and all of the, the media impact that it has do for Toronto Tobago in terms of destination branding, um, what we also call intellectual property branding. So certain products from Toronto and Tobago get um, further elevated in the global market space because of the carnival um, and so on and so on. Mm, that's probably worth another 20, 30 million US dollars. Um, and then the ancillary industries that benefit. So do we sell more beer because we, you know, more carib beer or more whatever because of it? Possibly. So you then add in another couple uh, million. So now you're talking about a 300 million US 
possibly even higher um, in terms of foreign exchange earnings. I'm not talking here about the economic impact on the domestic economy. If you then included that, um, which you have to be very careful not to do what we call double counting, um, you're then talking about another several million dollars, hundred million dollars in terms of domestic activity. So all told, we're talking about a billion dollar in TT dollars industry, if not more. So we need to measure this. Let me give you an example, and I'll, and I'll pass the, the mic over. So I used to live in Glasgow uh, for a number of years, and I used to go to the Edinburgh festivals. They have nine festivals that are collated at all around the same time. So a book festival, a film festival, dance festival, the international festival, the tattoo, which our um, steel pan defense force goes to often every year, and they like the biggest hit. Um, Edinburgh festivals generate um, the second highest level of foreign exchange for Edinburgh after the banking sector. And once that they have published those studies, which you do on an annual basis, it changed the dynamic. It changed the discourse. No longer was it just considered a nice time, you know, really important for the identity of Edinburgh and Scotland, which is all great and really important, though, you know. But the economic impact was a real surprise to them. Mm -hmm. I bet you if we were to document Toronto Tobago's carnival, in a systematic way and do this consistently, uh, then we would be surprised, the impact. It would then encourage us to make further investments um, and generate what I would call a stronger creative or dig and digital creative economy and a youth economy in particular um, because this industry really drives new jobs and entrepreneurship for young people. And this is where I think Trayan Tobago is failing. So every day you read in papers, concerns about foreign exchange, you know. We shouldn't be having that discussion. We should be talking about how do we boost our foreign exchange through economic diversification and innovation in new, these sectors. Um, we're having the wrong discourse. Um, and we're shrinking the economy from having that old debate that I think has long passed its sell-by date. Thank you very much. Two. Let me jump in here Absolutely. because this um, resonates deep in my soul. <laughs> I realize that. This is good. <laughs> um, Dr. Nils, because you hit so many nails on the head with this. And this is something that we as the Promoters Association went through during the pandemic in trying to explain to the government of Trinidad and Tobago the importance of our carnival and of the entertainment sector and the creative sector on the whole. Because I feel Trinidad... As much as it's a blessing, our oil and gas industry is a curse to us as well. Because government come, government go, you get sweet with oil and gas money. And the vision for most of, of the parties that come into power is a five-year vision. You would see a lot of them come and they want to make sure that they stay in for the next five years and they take the money and they spend it nice and they make everybody happy to get back the votes, right? All you're free to say it, but I will say it. And what that does for us is that people are not seeing that the oil and gas money is running out. Mm -hmm. I came from the oil and gas sector. I'm a mechanical engineer, and I worked for Petrotrain for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it is being said in forums, but it's not being said to the general public, that Trinidad and Tobago's oil and gas sector is not where it used to be many eons ago. And that is our main source of foreign exchange right now to our country. And when that runs out, what are we going to put in place? We have a product that we're sitting on here that generates foreign exchange for us. And what happens is that a lot of, of, of the people who make a lot of these important decisions kind of pacify the nation by saying, OK, here's what, NCC, hold how much of our $100 million, and all go ahead and make sure Carnival nice, and people have a fun time, and it's gone, and it's done. Carnival is over. But what Dr. Nurse was saying was, Canada invests in the sector. Do we invest in our carnival, invest in developing our creative sector and making it better for the next year? First of all, if you want to make something better, as Dr. Nurse says, you have to measure this thing. Mm -hmm. Are we measuring 
central bank, are we tracking the money? And this is where you all could come in. Where is the money going? How does it trickle down to the last man on the street who's selling chewing gum outside the FET? Where the taxi driver had to drop the person to the FET. The person had to get a haircut. The ladies had to get their nails done to go to the party. The mass man had to create the design and the wire bender, and all of these people form what we call an ecosystem that supports our carnival. So people may say Trinidad and Tobago Carnival make X amount of money because of visitor arrivals, but nobody is tracking and measuring that trickle down effect throughout the entire ecosystem of what carnival does for us and our economy, how it's supported by that. So I feel as though we need to focus a bit more on the trickle down effect and follow the money and invest more in it. And I would leave you all with this too, is that the government of Korea sat and planned out what people know today as K-pop. You all ever heard of K-pop music? Yeah. K-pop was an idea, a concept to generate income for the country itself. They created these little hubs and created these little platforms to manufacture musicians and boy bands and girl bands to export to the rest of the world. And there were studies done on K-pop and that boosted their economy tenfold, more than tenfold. And they used their music and their culture to do it and they created it. We don't need to recreate the wheel. We have carnival. We have musicians. We have soca music, Calypso, the pan. We say none on it. But you know what? We comfortable because we have oil money. But the oil money running out. Look, Guyana, gone with it. <laughs> They're gone with it. And if we don't wake up and smell the coffee, somebody else is going to take our carnival and put all the oil money in it and run away with it. And we're going to be saying, oh, but I we think. But it done gone. Because you didn't invest in the product. And what you did was you just spent money and you had the events and you didn't really try to improve it year on year. And, and I, I mean... NCC will get licks as a part of this, and mm -hmm. Gypsy and I are real good, and he know has always given this licks for it. But is that a lot of the time, from, from one generation to the next, what we lack within our carnival is accountability. Is saying, okay, we spent X amount of carnival, how many people attended these events? Mm -hmm. How was the event? How can we improve this thing next year? And let's measure this and improve again and keep improving and moving on and on and on for that. Versus, well, the carnival was nice. Yeah, and, and, and that's what sits deep in my soul. So thank you for letting me release it. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, this is, this is good. And this is exactly the kind of dialogue that we needed. And, and what I would want to sort of add to that is we have established, you know, here on the panel that we need the data. We've established that there's a lack of institutional will, political will to move forward in terms of generating this data in any meaningful way. So in order for the audience and I would say, you know, the bank to have some sort of actionable steps, what would you all say should be the next immediate step in terms of this move to start collecting this data? Because let us not be yet another discussion and dialogue that people then say, well, nothing has happened and we haven't given any kind of clear takeaways. Who, is, who, who needs to head this? And I'm going to throw it out to you, Keith, initially, and then I'm going to ask everybody to, to go from there because, you know, we really want to make sure that we have some takeaways from this instead of saying this should have happened. Where are we going now? Okay. Uh, in terms of methodology, um, you know, I, I use the same expression that, that um, Rome does, which is that I call it follow the money principle. So um, in the creative economy, um, wealth and value is generated in five key areas. Mm -hmm. It's goods, so steel pans. How many steel pans do we produce in Trinidad and Tobago? And how much do we export? Most of it is produced by Trinidad and Tobago uh, Instruments Limited um, and the mini pans. Because most people think we, we export big pans. Well, we really don't export big pans. They're very difficult to export. They're very bulky, etc. Plus many of the other markets, um, like particularly in Europe, um, people produce their own pans. They've figured out how to do so. And, um, and in some instances, they import 
the the, um, the steel pan, um, what do you call them? Arrangers, not arrangers, um, tuners. Um, so the, the tuners move, so that is income in services. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to capture data and services. Um, that includes um, the export of services in terms embodied in a human moving, um, what we call movement of natural persons. I don't want to get too technical here because this is like real trade policy 101, but movement of natural persons is one aspect. And then if you set up, so, so Caesar's Army probably has a company registered in multiple locations. So that's what we call establishment of presence. Mm -hmm. So that's mode three. That's another form of services income. Um, and when the tourists arrive here, that's mode two, which we call, you know, where people arrive or come to consume the service. And the real big kicker, which is the huge growth in services, is what we call online um, use of services, um, whether you're using your mobile or other devices over the internet. Um, that is the fastest rising component in services income, where we talk about digitalization in particular. Um, and then we switch to IP. We could generate income from IP um, in multiple ways, from copyright on music, copyright on designs, um, but also um, things like geographical indications, you can generate from patterns, you can generate from a whole range of things. Carla is more of an expert in this than I am. Um, but then there are other areas that are associated, like intellectual property branding. So Marshall Montano has chocolates. Um, so he's using that as, is using carnival as a mechanism to sell chocolates. Mm -hmm. And well, maybe why shouldn't we be doing it that way? Um, that's our key value added. Um, and then, there's some two key new areas of growth in the creative industries. One is data monetization. This is really where um, things like e-commerce comes into play, but also blockchain. Um, these are the areas where most developing countries don't even have a clue what's going on. Um, things like data localization are all really critical for digital industrialization. If we are not talking about these things, it means we are being left behind by the global economy. And the last area is what we call the experience economy. You're also seeing it linked to what we call the creator economy. So people who are doing blogs and um, you know, generating income from brand sponsorships, et cetera, et cetera, which a lot of young people are doing. Um, when you add up all of these five areas, they're the fastest growing areas in the global economy. Mm -hmm. It accounts for close to 8 to 10% of global trade, and we consider that to be an underestimate. The global economy is shifting away from goods and services in the narrow definition of it to experiences, data, and IP. Um, so, who is to collect all of this data? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, not talking now about a central statistical office. Our central statistical office is framed in an outdated 20th century model of collecting data. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't collect data on things like data monetization. Our, our tourism related agencies still, by and large, are counting what we call bums in seats and heads in beds. Um, so they will get you occupation occupancy data for hotels, and they'll get you data on arrivals. But you start scratching the service into, you know, like what do tourists actually consume when they come to your territory? And where are they, and are they sourcing it from other locations? Um, and what about your diaspora? All those kinds of things, most tourism agencies, um, including possibly Tran Tobago, Tourism Limited and the one in Tobago, and not capturing that data. Um, we need a, a new revolution. I mean, I just came back from the World Trade Organization public forum talking about these things, so it's fresh and on top of my head. Um, we need to be rethinking the economy as we understand it, but also the way in which we measure it. So. Um, we're all talking now up in global circles about transversal economics and satellite accounting. 
um, in, like in the case of tourism, most countries are using satellite accounting now because it, it captures the broader spread of flows rather than just counting what we call the widgets, like goods here, services there, and so on. It's more broad spread. So I, I would want to answer you by saying there's a multiplicity. So our departments that deal with intellectual property um, need to be in and the act. Um, but I would say ultimately, though, for the carnival industries, we need the actors in the carnival industry, the entrepreneurs, the associations, the special interest groups, to step up their game and report um, either in aggregate form, mm -hmm. their data. Mm -hmm. So we need to know from Jews, well, you know, we don't need to know exactly how much you earn, but we need to know where did you perform, which venues, um, what's the average income of people who supplied services to you. Mm -hmm. And we need to know that from all the other jewels, the, the hundreds of them, right? And then we aggregate the data, not your specific private data. Um, that will get us to the next level. Unless we do that, just asking the agencies, like the governmental agencies, to do it on their own is not sufficient. Want to? Right. Um, for, speaking on behalf of the Promoters Association, when we went out to find out to get data in terms of we had to put together a proposal to the government as to why our sector needed to be reopened because we were the last we were the first to close last to reopen so every week we doing proposals as to why we need to reopen and give some semblance of it and it was difficult for us to show in terms of the value our our industry held because of the lack of data and when we call around to this one and that one to get data nobody had data and it's not a matter of, and I hear you, that we should be willing to share the data, but who do we share this data to? Nobody collecting it. So it's not like a promoter could come and say, who are we going to talk to? Hi, Central Bank, we're making X amount of money. Is Central Bank collecting the data? Is CSO collecting the data? There's no entity that is reaching out to the industry to say, hi, we are doing a survey and we want to collect the data. Mm -hmm. And I feel as though here, and, and what you said resonated with me as well in terms of what Canada did. And I would like to ask, um, in terms of us, why are we trying to reinvent the wheel? There are other countries all over the world who have music festivals and who have creative sectors, and I'm sure they might have a system out there of how they measure this thing and how they track it. So I think, in my mind, um, why do we have to try to recreate a whole structure of how this could be done when we could probably reach out to somebody else who's doing it and find out how they are doing it and take parts of what they're doing and tweak it to suit our system? So again, it, it is a question to put out there to the central bank because they are the governing body when it comes to everything financial in Trinidad and Tobago, yeah. as if they would take up the mantle as to find out who is responsible for this and get somebody that we could report to. Because we are willing to share the information in terms of the creative sector because it will only help our industry if we could measure it, but there's nobody for us to tell this to. And Rome, uh, as you talk about the question of you know, not having, from your perspective, you know, having people to share the data with, and um, as Keith Nurth was telling us, all the various facets of data that we need to collect, I want to switch the mode of the conversation now to sort of next steps in terms of next generation. Because going back to the theme of the panel, we're looking at how do we re-engineer Carnival for sustainability? And a lot of times, um, and I, I shared this actually last week at a panel that I was involved in with AI. The, a lot of parents uh, call me all the time, very confused, very alarmed, and, and you know, I would say quite angry um, that their children want to go into the Carnival sector that they want to be involved in creative sector. They still have the very traditional arm on or hats on that you should be lawyer, doctor, engineer in order to go anywhere in society. Um, so I always try to explain to them that no, there are all these various entrepreneurial arms and different sectors that they could get involved in. So having said that, as we are talking about improving the sector, what would you all see uh, the professional skill sets that we need to hone in order for this industry to really be able to take shape and to develop in such a way that we're sustainable. And I want to start first with um, 
color, Cupid, you know, because you, you interact with so many people uh, from the tourism standpoint. So what are the professional skills that we, that we are lacking and we need to hone? In, in terms of professional skills, and I mean, we're talking about sustainability. I think, um, I, and this is me coming from a, a research background, actually. Um, so Dr. Nurse made me smile. I think there needs to be an understanding of what really goes into uh, creating this thing called carnival, um, and an appreciation of of where it comes from, the place that it comes from. And, and I know we're talking about professional skills, but this is something that happens organically for us mm -hmm. as a country. Um, so there's that part of it, but there's a part of it that the, the part of it that needs to look at it as a business. Mm -hmm. um, and that is why discourses like these are, are very important because now you're not looking at it. I think it was Rome that said it's not a fete or a party, not just a fete or a party. There's a whole ecosystem behind it. Um, and there needs to be an appreciation of that, um, even uh, at the secondary school level, um, primary school level as well. Um, and so I think it's important that as you know, our generation, we now share what goes into a carnival, what goes into producing an event like what Jews would do, what goes into the, admi why the administrative part of it is needed. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking to persons like Rome, you know, could really open our eyes in terms of what carnival is. Um, so professional skill set, yes, I hear you, but I think there needs to be just an understanding of, of what is the foundation of carnival. I mean, Rome is speaking about doing proposals and so on during the pandemic. I, I was on the receiving end of some of those proposals <laughs> and the passion that you, <laughs> you um, see here today. But it was then that, you know, me personally, I got a real deeper understanding. Listen, this is not just about visitor arrivals. I mean, you know it, but then it, it really became so much clearer. Um, there are a lot of people that benefit from carnival. Mm -hmm. As Rome said, don't the person selling the, the chewing gum outside the fet. Yeah? Um, so as the tourism agency, while we're trying to encourage people to visit Trinidad for carnival, visit Trinidad for any other festival, there's a whole trickle-down effect. And for us to really improve the sustainability of carnival, um, and for this discussion to make sense, I think those persons at the school level, they must be taught um, that carnival is not just the little school um, fete that you have in during the, the, the February to March period, right? The people that the vendors that come to sell at the fete, they're going to benefit as well. The people who put in up the trussing, they're going to benefit as well. The people who are doing the little transportation, the little shuttle service, they're going to benefit as well. So I think that, that, that to me is the crux of the matter. Okay, um, thank, thank you for that. And I agree with you in terms of the holistic aspect i am getting a cue that we're we're pretty much almost out of time so let me just get a uh, pantry and beagle perspective in terms of these skill sets because you would uh interact with a wide variety of people a lot of young people not just based here but from different countries that come in you know so what what's your perspective on these skill sets that are required our skill sets are quite large because the instrument requires a diverse amount of skills, beside the people playing the pan music. But we have the makers of the pans, or tuners, or manufacturers. We have the people who make stands, sticks, cases. In the pan yards, they make racks, wellers, you know. We have the fact that even in the pan yard, you would have people who would, when the band is rehearsing, you, somebody will come from the area probably and cook food 
or sell things. So skill sets, or all the skill sets of developing a country. But what is more critical, I think, um, from Dr. Nurse's point of view, who do we see as the one to start collecting all this data? Now, under Cabinet Note 1999, in 1999, NCC, the National Carnival Commission, is the umbrella body for all aspects carnival. And I think it is under that body, government needs to step up and create the areas somebody to collect all the data, somebody to, as Rome say, when I send my proposal in, have qualified people to read the proposal, you know, because we're not reinventing the wheel. No. A lot of this is being done outside, but we in the industry know and see what it is the industry needs. And the data collection is critical because the entertainment industry earns $722 billion worldwide. Why can't we get a, pie, a piece of that pie? with our entertainment industry. We don't have to borrow anybody's hours. Carnival time is one period. We now, August month is now a big month in China with Pan Month and World Steel Pan Day and all that. So that's another area. They have fets during that time, they have band launches. So if you look at it, every month in China and Tobago have some aspect of our festival, yeah. our heritage. We have Diwali, we have all these things. These all fall into the creative industry in China and Tobago. And if it is, let's say, National Carnival Commission is the umbrella body in terms of, let's say, carnival, then it is in that body, development, the research, and all of the things that go with making carnival better, more sustainable, they are the ones should have people there researching, go out to Edinburgh, find out how it is they did it, how they have all these different festivals at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then bring it to us so we sit collectively and collaborate to say, right, this will be better for us. This will be better for us. And we create this, which is probably going to be the biggest revenue earner in the next 10, 15 years for this country. So we have to get very serious about it. The skill sets run from the very low skill sets to the highly professional skill sets if we are looking at this re-engineering process. We, we lack in some, we lack in some um, skill sets heavily in the industry, though. And... Um, because of what something Carla mentioned, is that a lot of the people who go to school, your parents wanted to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer, that sort of thing. My, mm -hmm. Even me, I was an engineer. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the youths coming up don't know, because of a lack of knowledge, that the creative industry is a very lucrative industry. And because of that lack of knowledge, not only them, but their parents don't encourage them to do it. Also, what we don't have is and, and let me just speak specifically to the music that surrounds Carnival. We don't really have a music industry. Mm -hmm. So as much as we have musicians that put out great music, there's a lack of structure for the music industry here in Trinidad and Tobago. So what I see, because I wear the other hat of being an artist and an entertainer myself, mm -hmm. is what hurts me is when I have to see a big entertainer, and I'm sure you all see this in the public domain a lot of the time, the entertainers, when they're young, they're making their money. When they get older, there's nothing in place for them. Yeah. And this is because of a lack of knowledge. You see them get sick, and you see somebody having a barbecue, or some cake sale, or some Go concert funding. to try to get money for them because they're ill and they can't perform. Because what a lot of the entertainers in our industry do is that it's becoming a job for them. And you're not realizing that the day you're not performing, you're not making money. And you have to start to look at it as a business. And again, this is a lack of knowledge for them. So what we need to put in place is a better structure for our entertainment sector and the music sector so that people know that there's the entertainer who is the performer, who is the CEO of a company. So first of all, every entertainer should register themselves as a company. So I, have, I am Rome, and my company is It's Rome, and I'm registered as a sole trader. But you could register as a LLC as well depending on the number of employees. Now, as an entertainer and you register yourself as a business, you would have employees under you, and a manager, you would have a publicist, you would have a PR person, marketing persons. All of these things mm -hmm. encompass you as a business. And I think what we need to start to focus on is structuring this as a business. Mm -hmm. So we lack the skill sets in this avenue because if you look around, most of the entertainers, they don't really have managers. They would say they have a manager, but what they really have is a booking agent. 
is somebody who answers the phone and they take the book in, they write it down and they, you go again. Or somebody who hustling and trying to get you on a stage in a fet and calling Jews and say, Jews are this man here, boy, you have a real good song, put me on a stage now. That actually happens in the business. Jews will tell you that. Versus having a manager of somebody who can manage the artist and strategize and put a marketing plan in place and how are we going to export this artist out of Trinidad and Tobago, get him or her on this stage or on that stage and what brand endorsements we could get, which brand could support them. We don't have that. We have a hustle. A man have a big tune this year for Carnival, he gain all the bookings. That same man or woman who had a tune, next year they do have a big tune, they will sit down home and suck salt whole season. <laughs> and that is exactly what happens. And is, the sad part is, the way how the entertainment industry, the music industry, the soca industry is structured, is that it's very seasonal. And it is the only music industry where every year you have to have a hit song. And the time September hits, that song that was a hit last year, nobody wants to hear it again. And therefore, now you have to have a new song to go again for the season. If you ask any other music industry, that Cisco sang tongue song and sing that for years. <laughs> and uh, people then know it's one verse he have in his song. And he sing it over and over and over and over and over. <laughs> he sing it for years. And I remember, I think, in an interview with Kevin Little, he was saying that soca music is a music where people only market it for the carnival period, and then you drop it. And we're not seeing that that is killing our industry. And now we had to create new music and new music and new music every year, and it's just around carnival. And people just let go their music if it do become a hit within that period. So I think we lack that skill set in mm -hmm. structuring our soca, calypso, music industry um, to propel it further. That is a very, very strong uh, you know, ending, Rome. And you know fully well that I endorse everything that you've said in terms of looking at the industry as a business. We are 100% out of time um, in terms of this aspect of the, of the discussion. So what I want to say to you all in 60 seconds, if you could just, you know, rein it in uh, for this last part before we go to our, um, you know, next segment is I really want to us to sort of leave our audience with an understanding of the importance of non-operating in silos, because that is very often the criticism that's leveled at the entertainment industry and at Carnival, that all these various interest groups operate um, separately. So very quickly, just you know, 60 seconds per person, what would you all say coming out of this discussion and all that we have you know, sort of you know, pontificated on, what are the most critical areas of collaboration between yourselves um, in order to allow for sustainability of Carnival? So Jules, you're in Caesar's Army, who would you collaborate with uh, most critically? And then we'll just end off there. Okay, very quickly for me, um, three collaborations. Creative times technology. I believe that's the future because as Dr. Nils was also speaking about uh, CSO office and data back in the day and you used to get your brochure, or your profile or whatever it is. Now is the time for AI being aligned with the creative. So in other words, real intelligence times artificial intelligence. I think that's a key thing for the future. Mm -hmm. Secondly, knowledge transfer, mm -hmm. mentorship. Those who know need to build a bridge to those who learning or need to know. Mm -hmm. That is really important. And three, collaboration with the carnival and its stakeholders is so key. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard this point over and over based on Trinidad and Tobago is the Mecca. We are supposed to be leading this entire carnival race. The day that carnival slips, an entire ecosystem will slip. It is important that the stakeholders understand that we need to be working together for brand T and T for this thing to be sustainable mm -hmm. and for it to thrive. Carla, where who would you, you know, where do you see a critical area of collaboration with between Visit Trinidad and others on the panel specifically? <laughs> Um, well, as I mentioned before, Visit Trinidad would have worked with like Pantrin Bago and, um, 
and other promoters as well, uh, particularly during the carnival period. But where I see uh, is critical for us in terms of this, this discussion is that we need to work closely and, and we're moving towards that. Persons who, you know, create experiences and do events and so on. Because what we are doing and, and the thrust that we're going after is festival development. Um, I mentioned it earlier where we spoke about, um, where I spoke about, you know, dealing with the, the peaks and troughs in terms of visitor arrivals throughout the year. Um, when we talk about the sustainability of Carnival and all we need to do to ensure that it is the, the impact of Carnival is properly measured, this, to me, mindset needs to now spread to other festivals that mm -hmm. happen throughout the year. Um, mm -hmm. We're talking about Diwali, we're talking about Band Launch Festival, uh, because, yeah, Parang, Christmas, yeah. Because what we are trying to do at Tourism Trinidad Limited is ensure that there are these blocks of time throughout the year, uh, create a calendar of events where people can choose now to come to Trinidad, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think it is critical for us to work with people like Jules, to work with people who put on these events because, and I said it before, we're a very creative people. So there's not much for us to do um, other than identify these people who would be key to how we address um, the development of the tourism industry and how we strategize in going forward with ensuring that, listen, those persons who live out there, they're looking for a reason to visit Trinidad. Mm -hmm. Here are several reasons throughout the year. Yeah, so I think that is critical for us. Thank you. For the Promoters Association, what I would say is we would like a general collaborative effort across the board before carnival happens. Yeah. So yeah. I feel what should take place, which I only saw it happen in the pandemic, mm -hmm. and then it all fall down, is that a series of meetings should be held mm -hmm. leading up to Trinidad and Tobago's carnival, like all now, October, where all the entities sit in one room and we map this thing out. And Colored is where it kind of falls under your ministry, not under your purview, but under the Ministry of Tourism, Culture, and the Arts. They should be the ones to initiate this meeting, bring all the stakeholders together, the NCC, the hotels, the flights, the promoters, the Pantry and Bago, Tuco, everybody under one roof, in one room, and say, all right, okay, guys, this is what is going to happen for Carnival. We are all on the same page. How much flights are they expecting? Could we bump up this? Could we contact some other airlines to get this? We need more people in. Hotels, where your capacity at? What was the pass? How are we going to make it better? Do we need to bring in some cruise ships and have them docked on board to, in, to put more people? Airbnb, are we going to explore this? And I feel as though we had to look at this thing from a holistic approach versus yeah. NCC does their thing, Pantry and Mego do their thing, promoters, we doing our thing, and everybody operating in their little silos. And we're not seeing that in order for the carnival product as a whole to get better, we all need to come together to do this thing. But it needs one entity to kind of lead the entire thing. And that's where I think it falls under that ministry to kind of push that because it directly is incorporated with them. Excellent. Tini? Okay. Um, Pantry and Bagel. Well, in terms of what my fellow panelists have said, we believe in the fact that we should be collaborating. And that collaboration should start really maybe around Easter time. Because what we hear, for example, and I'll give you a, a single example, Tobago Carnival is coming up. There are no empty flights out of North America <laughs> the couple of days before that. If you try to go down on the port to get a ferry to go to Tobago that weekend, it book up. What's the, if we are going to re-engineer Carnival for sustainability, and we're talking about developing our cultural tourism, festival tourism, heritage tourism, because we have all those three aspects that we could use for tourism. We, those things are key factors. Flights in, our ferry services, and as Rome just said, yeah, we don't have enough hotels, so why don't we think in advance? Let's bring four cruise ships in next year so when people want flight, we create more flights so when they come in, they have a place to stay. And really and truly, it, this will all fall under the Ministry of Tourism, Culture, and the Arts because they're the ones with tourism, culture, 
arts, the creativity sector. And therefore, the collaboration is important because when we come together and we share the ideas, we all look at it from our view, our specific area. But when we sit down around a table and share those ideas, we can come up with such a meaningful product that the entire country will benefit. And it's not just only we look at carnival, but festival tourism is all the entry in and Tobago. From carnival in the start, you have Easter time, is a, a festival in itself. Tobago has Heritage Festival. We have Diwali, Emancipation. That is a big time. We are the first country in the world that recognized and had a holiday for emancipation. That's why August month should be a big festival month in Trinidad and Tobago. Jews, Rome, ourselves, tourism. We should have millions of visitors coming because you know why? You start from emancipation, one aspect of our, our society, to independence. And so many things can happen in between. So the collaboration is critical and really and truly, we, it should fall under our Ministry of Tourism, Culture and the Arts to start to bring us together. So when we do the collaboration, we know that we are now building a product, getting people involved, creating a unit to do all the data research and the data collection so we know exactly where we're going. And rather than reinvent the wheel, we research what is being done outside and adapt it to make our festival, our tourism sector better. Thank you. Final thoughts, uh, 60 seconds. Okay, thank you very much, Carla. I, I want to endorse all that my co-panelists have said. Um, I think they've really hit some really key and strategic points. But since we are at the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, I want to conclude by making some recommendations for the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so first off, uh, I think it's really incumbent and it's a responsibility of a central bank to capture the data uh, related to this sector and to do it on a systematic basis. If not doing it itself, ensuring that it's done by the other institutions in the ecosystem uh, and being done in some kind of collaboration. Why is this so important? Well, as I said earlier today, um, if you read the newspaper, if you listen to what's happening on radio or television, everybody's concerned about the foreign exchange crisis in Trinidad and Tobago. There's no crisis. It's just that we're not managing it well. We're not managing our foreign exchange well. Um, we're not boosting potential sources, and we're not managing our expenditure or use of foreign exchange well. So this sector is a major source of foreign exchange, and the central bank and other institutions need to step up and play a critical role. The second thing is the, the issue of financing. Financing in this sector, sector has always been really problematic. Well, I think Rome made the point earlier, this is not rocket science. This issue is being dealt with in other jurisdictions quite seamlessly. So in several African countries, and um, the central bank and other um, development banks play a critical role in terms of um, what we call leveraging finance through um, providing enhanced guarantee credit funds so that it is not the central bank that is lending the money per se, but is encouraging the commercial banks to lend, to on lend um, to entrepreneurs in the sector by providing um, low interest guarantee funds. This can catalyze the sector in a fundamental way so that we see a huge growth. And the third and last thing is that we really need to be able to um, use the central bank as a champion for the broader diversification of the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, it's the most, one of the most stable institutions in the country, and it provides a leadership role. Now, often it's fairly circumscribed based on the act and so on, um, but within that, there's a fair amount of leverage for us to move from being a, a, a passive response to what's happening in the economy to something that's more proactive. Um, Trinidad and Tobago, as an economy, and I could say this without fear of contradiction, has run out of gas. Um, if you look at our foreign exchange earnings, if you look at our exports, if you look at um, our employment scenario, 
Uh, we have an unemployment rate of 12% for young people, which accounts for 46% of total unemployment. This is not acceptable going forward. Our economy and society needs a major injection of leadership. And I think the central bank, among other institutions, can play a critical role in reshaping. And Carnival and the creative economy is a huge um, boom, boom to what we call the youth economy. And this is where we need to make significant investments. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, all the panelists. <laughs> At the <laughs> Please, I know we out of time. I beg one last comment, right? And it's directed straight at the central <laughs> bank because it's something off of what Dr. Nurse said. And this is my last comment on this: is that I would beg the central bank to pull all of the banks together and make it easier for us to open an account for the business owners, especially if we want the sector uh, to right. be more streamlined into being able to track the money. A lot of those who are on the ground will find it is a very tedious process, one, for you to register your business, and two, to open a bank account associated with your business. I opened a bank account in London. It took me 15 minutes to register my business online and open the bank account. In Trinidad and Tobago, there is something that is called ease of business, and we have unease of business. <laughs> because to do anything in here, you have to get so many things. They want to know what my grandmother cooked yesterday <laughs> for me to open a bank account here or to register anything here. And I wish, I implore the central bank, if you all could get all the banks together and make this process, and to it with the government as well, the process, the ease of doing business in Trinidad and Tobago needs to be much quicker and more efficient, especially in the era of technology. I should be able to go online and do this. And as again, we're not reinventing the wheel, I did it online in London from my office in Trinidad and Tobago in a couple of minutes. Yeah, I done. I done. I, um, Rome, I completely empathize and I, I've, I've been through it myself, you know, in terms of the, the absolute trauma, you know, of having to go through this bank account process. So I get it and, and I, I hope that the powers that be are hearing and listening and, you know, can implement some of what we are, have been discussing. Now, at this juncture, I would love to open up the floor to questions, um, you know, directed to our panelists. We have a microphone there if anyone uh, is, has anything that they would like to ask any of us, any of the panelists, I should say. We also have an um, online audience, so we are currently collating the questions from these persons as well. Okay. okay. Just bear with me, I'm just getting some of the questions. Okay, please, please go ahead. I can actually. See. Oh yes, thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon, panel. Carla, can you hear me? Not very clearly. Okay, right. Um, I didn't know we was having this question and answer um, period. So I didn't do my research as well as I would like to. But um, based on just raw data I have from what I read. Um, in terms of arrivals for Carnival, I think we peaked at 43,000 sometime in 2005, 2006. And since then, between 2010 and now, visitor arrivals have been like between 34 to 38 to 9,000 people, right? So we peaked way back then, and then the numbers have kind of just fluctuated. So what I would like to know, I probably could direct this to Dr. Nurse, why haven't we not seen further growth, if we peaked way back then, and then we have kind of, well, declined since then, um, why do you think there's this dip in visa arrivals? And from what the data suggests, a lot of the arrivals are retailing nationals and their kids, so why, given the number of spin-offs we have had with our carnival, why are we not seeing 
a larger growth there with regards to arrivals, right? That's one. Two, um, in the past, you had to come to Trinidad Carnival to get certain events, you know, the tribe events, Soka Brain Wash, that kind of stuff. But now, you could get them abroad. So you need to come to Trinidad to get certain things that are no longer there. And then, flights to Trinidad is expensive, the costumes are expensive, the party is expensive. Jamaica Carnival is growing, Spice Mass is growing. Are you all concerned that we might, we might see further shrinkage because people no longer have to come here to get certain events, given that they're getting it outside and the expense involved, right? That is two. And lastly, um, I will need some ambush tickets. I don't, know, <laughs> I don't know if there's anybody in the panel that could assist, but I would appreciate that. <laughs> so. I mean, the ambush tickets, you know, so. <laughs> Go, go, go brave first, Jules. Um, check. Um, I think that um, I, I'm just going to answer the second one, which has also been a topic for me. Um, I, I'm not very uh, as close to the statistics as maybe uh, Dr. Nurse Carla. Um, but I do believe that um, the emergence of other carnivals is going to be a factor. Because just this is my personal opinion. From watching this year alone, it is more economical, more value for money for persons to attend other carnivals that are probably now emerging for something that is similar to our product. So ideally for us, this is why I kept asking about what is truly our unique selling proposition? Is it just the FETs? No, I don't believe in that. And remember, events are kind of twofold eh? because they are FETs, and then there's also events, the Mashgra, Sukha Monarch, for example, right? Is it the Pan? Is it the Mass? Is it an experience? And somehow, some way, we have to understand, even though Jerome clearly defined, Pan came from us. Mass came from us. <laughs> the music, soca, chutney, calypso, came from us. In fact, that's what carries the other carnivals. Right? So ideally, I don't think the problem is what we actually have. It's actually what are we selling to the world as a holistic or as a unique experience. Right? So I... I from where I sit, I definitely could see that um, the existing carnivals need to watch themselves in general, right? Spice Mass has elevated because I think um, they did a thrust in terms of pushing the Grenada Carnival this year, and Jab is becoming a big thing, right? Jab was always there, <laughs> right? So ideally for us, it begs the question, how do we, in this next era, of carnival, how do we really change the mindset to what we are taking to the world and even further now? Because even Jerome was saying it, you know, um, Africa, why isn't Africa aligned to what we are doing here from a Trinidad and Tobago standpoint? Why, why aren't there many carnivals in Africa since we are so similar, right? It's the same for India, right? We need to think further and outside of the box now. Right? But I do believe that we need to find the unique selling point of our entire carnival. Because if we don't watch ourselves, all these 101 carnivals are happening around the world, people are going to look at the economical feasibility of coming here. Is Private Ryan going to have his events? Is it that Marshall is going to be in concert? Is the mass designers that are coming from here providing the same costumes for over there? We have to watch that. And I could try and organize the ambush tickets. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> um, on, on that point, you, you made a very strong point because this is our discussion I've been having since the pandemic because we have this sort of ego with us that Trinidad and Tobago is the best carnival in the world. We are the Mecca and nobody else carnival will be better than ours. And for now, it's true. But for how long can we sustain that with all the other carnivals uprising and the promoters realizing, wait now, but I could go out there 
and do the same for they're doing here and make US dollars and make more money or, or, or get other opportunities and they're going to give that experience. You said the carnival costumes, these designers are designing for all the other carnivals all over the world. So they're going to get the same costumes that we have. The, one of the major problems I see we face with our carnival is, the, again, the ease of doing things here. I have friends who from all over the world who hear about our carnival and they want to come. One, a flight is very difficult to get. Two, the price of the flights are ridiculous to travel at that point in time. Three, is a fight up to get a hotel room and accommodation here. Four, they don't know how to go about the carnival. There's no one place for them to understand how do I get into a band? Which is the band? What these bands represent? What kind of band this is? How do I register on this band? Just last night, a friend from London messaged me, which is the bands? How are going on this site? She doesn't know. I had to send her, well, these are the bands who I think you might fit into. So I would send her that. If you don't know, to an average foreigner who just heard about Trinidad and Tobago's carnival, they don't know how to go about doing it. And we lack that. And there's nobody to explain this to them. We lack concierge services to cater to these people. Somebody in Trinidad and Tobago is asking, how are going to get an ambush ticket? So imagine somebody from, not from Trinidad and Tobago. They don't know about it. We have a sort of exclusivity in terms of our carnival where you have to know somebody to know somebody to get into a fet. You have to know somebody to know somebody to get into a band. And that is a deterrent for somebody who wants to come here who's not from here. So we had to find a way to make this much easier for a tourist to come here. Mm -hmm. a, a simple thing like transport is an issue. We don't have Uber here. So when a, a foreigner reach down here and they reach to Trinidad and Tobago, they want to go to a FET. We have a few rideshare apps, that, and, and I will not pong in them, but it is not the most efficient system that we have here. I travel to Cayman Islands for their carnival. At the end of the FET, they made, at the end of every single fete, they made an announcement. All right, to all tourists, if you need a ride home, you're going on call 777-7777. And I, look how easy that number was. You go get that wrong? No, but they have a system in place across their island where any tourist who needs a drop to their hotel, you call this number and they have a taxi service waiting outside all the fete. In Trinidad and Tobago, if you don't have a car to get around, crap will smoke your pipe. Because if you're coming from south and you want to come in town and fet and you're a tourist, how are you going to drop home? You can't, you don't have, we don't have a proper transport system in place for this. And that's why I said, in terms of collaborative efforts, this is where we need to come together. Mm -hmm. Get the taxi association together mm -hmm. and put a system in place where people feel safe to use our system to go to the FET to come back and all of that. Who going to get the tickets for them? All of those things. So you have, have a very, very strong point there, sir, in terms of we are at risk of losing our carnival if something doesn't take place sooner than later. We just, we have just about five more minutes for questions. So I just wanted to read a quick comment here that was sent us on YouTube from Astra Le Pair. She said, a Trinidad contingent privately visited and conducted workshops and carnival activities in South Africa as far back as 2010 to 11. Please use this and build on it because it was very successful. I don't know if anybody on the panel has any experience or any awareness or knowledge of this South Africa visit. Um, if, does anybody? No. Okay. But it's, that's not unusual. We've been doing this for a very long time. I mean, mm -hmm. I've met people from New Zealand, um, Australia, um, I mean, all parts of Europe. I mean, you just name the place. There's been... Uh, a connection to the Trinidad Carnival, um, which is great. Eh? And let me put it this way. Um, the proliferation of Trinidad and Tobago Carnival is a world beater. Um, I have a, a paper that I wrote a long time ago um, in the late 90s entitled The Globalization of Trinidad Carnival. It's been replicated in French, Spanish, I think Korean, um, it's been republished in multiple books um, because when people talk about globalization, they normally think of north to south flows. 
the fact that we have from a small island with a population of 1.3 million people an export of an experience to the north, to the south, and everywhere, um, to over 100 festivals, and these festivals are the largest in their jurisdictions. So, the largest outdoor public event in the United States is what? Use knows, because he's you. confused. No. No, but the, the, the biggest right? one is the New York Carnival. Oh. The biggest outdoor public event in Canada wow. is Caribana. Right. The yeah. biggest public outdoor event in Europe is Notting Hill. And I could go down the list. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the problems is that we don't know this. And this is well documented for a long time. I tell you, I wrote this paper back in the late 1990s. All right, so um, and if you don't know this, then you can't maximize on it. It's not part of your mind frame. Uh, we still think in the trend to be a carnival is a small little thing here in a small little island. Well, no, perish the thought. So that's the first key point. So the, the question that was asked was about data arrivals and so on. Actually, 2019 and 2020 surpassed the, um, the 20, 2006 peak, which was 42,000. So we are, went up to about close to 48,000 in 2019 and 2020. In 2020, which is this, the year, we really scraped through with that with the pandemic, you know. Uh, another week or two, we would have been in real trouble. Um, <laughs> but the point is that 2020 was the year of the highest arrivals and the highest earnings um, thus far for all the recorded years of Trinidad and Tobago Carnival. So we need to be proud of that. But in many respects, we've plateaued into that, let's say, 40 to 50,000 range in terms of arrivals now for almost two decades. Um, so we really need to be thinking, um, are there other means by which we can generate tourism flows? Um, how can this be spread more geographically across Tran Tobago? So the growth of the Tobago Carnival is a really important investment in that regard. I'm not sure that we are documenting the, the impact well enough. So again, it falls into this good old trap of not being measured. Um, and I also, there are things like virtual tourism. So you don't really have to be here. Um, how can we tap into that, utilizing all the new technologies, virtual reality, gaming, um, so the gamification of Toronto Carnival, who's doing that? Um, putting it into you know, all the modern technologies um, and using all mod the modern technology like 3D printing to produce the costumes here rather than importing them from China. Um, so, there's a whole range of new possibilities utilizing digital technologies that we haven't yet begun to really scratch the surface with. And, uh, and that is the fundamental question and the fundamental issue, is that we are still thinking that this is a FET, when in fact it's a FET multiplied by a thousand squared. And we have generated a value proposition that is second to none. I go to festival conferences all around the world, and when I give them the figures for Trinidad and Tobago Carnival, they go crazy. They're like, wow, you guys have done such an amazing job. Um, but I come back to Trinidad and Tobago, and I have been discussing these things for more than two decades now. Um, it gets a whimper of a response. As a country, um, we are not r absolutely proud of who we are and what we contribute to the world. We need to own up to that fact because it's not matched by investment and it's not matched by strategic intentions. This we must change, otherwise our economy will continue to falter. And the golden goose that has laid this beautiful egg, well, it may step onto another jurisdiction. 
I made all of these predictions. I'm hoping that I'm not correct. Um, I'm hoping that we will, you know, step up to the plate, do the re-engineering as Carla has called for. Um, otherwise, I would say that the growth of the other carnivals, both in the region and outside of the region, are gunning for us. But our role is to stay in front of them all the time, to be the place where you come to learn about the new technologies. The, 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 the Metropolitan Police in London used to come to Trinidad to learn how to police a carnival. We could be exporting a whole range of services that are not just linked to costuming and music and whatever. There's a whole plethora of industrial capacities that we have developed, which we are largely unaware of. And that's our fault. Um, we're not doing our homework, we're not doing our research, we're not investing in R&D, we're not investing in new technologies, we're not providing the financing and the new mechanisms of innovative financing. That's our fault, our responsibility, and we need to correct it. Thanks very much, um, Keith, for that intervention, and I know that a lot of people would have gotten value from that. We have someone here, you know, on the floor waiting to ask a question. I would ask that you introduce yourself, let us know if you're affiliated with any organization and direct your question to somebody on the panel. And I would ask the panelists, please, for you know, really sort of short and tight answers as we are really um, behind time and we have other presentations to follow us. Hi. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? No? I'm not sure. You can hear me? You could just speak up just a little bit. Okay. Hi. Okay, hi, I'm Giovanna Peters. I'm an economist at the Ministry of Trade and Industry. I have a question. Um, I'm going to speak as a representative for all young people. And I noticed that in this conversation, we were more focusing on the, how we can market Carnival internationally. And I think we need to consider how we can make it more accessible domestically. So we're talking about how we would make it better for tourists and how we compare to other carnivals. But I think we need to look inward. For example, there's no reason why a carnival costume should cost me two or three salaries. There's no reason why I should have to pick and choose two or three fets to attend because they're now all $500. And then to get into the fets, I have to have a credit card because I have to buy it online. And then I have to negotiate with a um, committee member for three hours and beg for a ticket. I think um, someone said to me once, the best competitors are those that compete with their best selves. So whilst we are looking at other carnivals and saying, well, they do this, they do that, we should do this, I think we should look inward and think, okay, how can we make this more accessible domestically as opposed to marketable internationally? Yes, it will earn foreign exchange and what have you, but you can earn money domestically. I think we should not just focus on pleasing the tourists, but we should also look at how we could make it so more sustainable for us in Trinidad and Tobago. What do these citizens want? You know, in terms of sustainability, you can't just look outward. We have to really focus on what we have to offer here, right? Um, I'll throw in this directly for the um, Promoters Association. We cannot afford, if you could, right? You want us to attend these FETs, you want data. We will attend, but not for $500 every FET, you know? I think these are things we should consider, how we can make it safer for our citizens, safer for young women, you know? Like, for example, I'm going to wrap up now. Um, if I have to go to a fed, I have to pick three. I'll pick one cooler party, one in all-inclusive, one juve party. This does not make sense. If you want to make a package for everything, then I think we should look at it holistically because, to be honest, Carnival starts from January, and that's the citizens. The tourists come like two weeks before, one week before. We need to focus on our people before we can look at what we can sell to persons abroad. Thank you, anyone can take that. 
room uh, just before you um, interject, just a reminder that we are out of time. Unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions from the audience or from YouTube or Facebook, but this is going to be posted uh, on the Central Bank YouTube channel so you all can take a look and digest the information um, as necessary. So, Rome ending with you. So, um, very, very, very good point. And we know that the cost keeps rising. Every year, Carnival gets more and more expensive. Um, first, let me, let me address the issue of the costumes. So what people don't take into consideration is that purchasing a Carnival costume is not the costume itself. It is the experience. And with that comes a lot of things that people don't think at the top of your mind. But in a Carnival experience, Yes, you have to pay for the costume. For the costume is the designer, is the materials, is the wire bender, the feather, all of these things for the costume itself. After that, you have to consider the trucks on the road, the music trucks. We had to pay cut in terms of licensing to get that. You have to pay for the security on the road. You have to pay for the police. You have to pay for fire. You have to pay for EME. There are many things that go into a carnival experience. The drinks, the alcohol, the, the, the wee-wee truck, the, the lunch stop, the food. The, and I think people just say, those who have never played mass before, on the outside, they look at it and say, well, why are I paying $5,000 for a costume? But you're not realizing that you're not paying $5,000 for a costume. You're paying $5,000 for a two-day experience. Now, if you look at Jamaica's carnival and you look at their prices, I heard Jamaicans complaining, why are costume costing so much money? And why are we paying so much for one day on the road when it's about the same thing and again two days in Trinidad? So as much as we complain, out there they complain as well. And I feel it's because of a lack of understanding of all of the elements that go into the carnival that people complain about. One thing for us as promoters that we face a challenge is the rising cost of things. And I always say this in, in, in joke, but it's real. Everybody want a cut, including cut. So <laughs> as people see carnival come around, our doors start to get knocked on by every single agency you could think of who want a piece of the pie. And nobody realizes that as their prices increase, it causes the promoter price to increase. And the last thing, and I think this is what patrons don't realize, the last thing that any promoter wants to do is to increase the price of their tickets. Right, Jules? Because we are always afraid of deterring people from attending events by increasing our prices. So anytime you see a Fed price ticket increase, is because of necessity and not because of you have a greedy promoter who's just trying to make a lot of money. I'm not saying they do have greedy promoters, because they are. And in any sector, you have people like that. But most promoters try to keep their costs right down so that they could extend it to our patron because it's a competitive environment. And you have so many fets on the same night now that by you having a cheaper ticket could help you get an edge over somebody else. So you try to keep your costs down. And one, one entity I would always haggle with in the public domain is the police because as they never realize that as much as we want security in effect for the patrons, we also have to manage this as a business for us. Because if you give the police service a chance sometimes, they will send out three to four police stations worth of police officers to one FET. And we just wonder, well, if it have a crime in this place, we're going to find police, boy, because <laughs> all of them in effect. And that is, again, where we need to have structure in place where you know you have a calculator to calculate how many police are assigned at what rates or whatever. But people don't realize, and Jules, yeah, I forget to tell all of this, what come in is police salaries are supposed to get an increase. And when police salaries get an increase, mm -hmm. promoter's bill going up. <laughs> and when promoter bill go up, honey, the Fed go and be 550. <laughs> right? Because, again, people not understand any ripple effects of all of these things that make up the ecosystem of our FET or of our carnival. And I feel it's just us having to explain this in our public domain that people could understand what it is we have to go through in the elements of our FET. Because you just see you went in a party and you had a good time, but you didn't see all of the things, the shuttle that took you there, 
the person who was ushering you there, the e-ticket system, the lights man, the stage, the fire officers, the police that were there, the toilet person who make sure the place was clean and all of the different things. If you had a backyard event, it would be way cheaper. But because of all of the systems are in place to have a FET, there are many different costs. Even, as I mentioned, cut with copyright organizations, we have to pay, which a lot of people don't know, the music that you hear in a FET, the promoter has to pay Cut, which is the copyright organization of Trinidad and Tobago, so that all of the music that played is shared up equally with all the people's music that are played in the FET itself for the artists to get money. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. You know, to all the panelists, I want to thank you for your contributions and your time, and we hope that you know you all found this to be really valuable discussion. And clearly, we need to have a second and a third and a fourth part <laughs> of these discussions. Thank you, Carla. Can we give our panelists and our moderators a round of applause? So on behalf of the Central Bank and for all of those here, we want to thank you so much for the riveting and thought-provoking conversation on our culture. We appreciate you all taking the time to be with us to discuss this topic that is vital to the identity of being Trinbegonian, but sometimes is either oversimplified or not given that dedicated analysis and care that it needs. And a huge thank you to all of you joining us online as well, as well as in person. And as we prepare for our cultural presentation that I think is going to bring a lot of thought-provoking ideas on what traditional mass is, we will invite our senior manager of human resources and knowledge management, Mrs. Nicole Crooks, as well as Suzanne Ramirez, our assistant manager, and Kevin Finch, our manager of research, to provide some tokens of appreciation to our panelists as we prepare the stage for our cultural presentation. Panelists, if you can join us on this side, please.
governor, I can't see you, but we just want you to come to the stage, please. This is how we do it at the bank. We give instructions to our governor. So just calling him to come forward. We'd like you to present to our moderator, our lovely moderator. So if you can come forward. Don't be shy, you gotta go shy. Yeah? <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So we invite our panelists and moderator to have a seat in the auditorium as we welcome our cultural presentation. So after all is said and done, the mass gets the final word. We will be hearing from six traditional mass portrayals as they explore and examine the topic at hand from their unique and idiosyncratic perspectives, beginning with the leader of the band, the Perro Grenade, who uses his special skills to spell sustainability, a word that people love to throw wrong, but to live by, not really. Yes, here in Trinbago, where old talk is the order, and the ability to sustain is always somehow tied to making a dollar. We so often forget that what makes culture worthwhile is not the money it makes, but rather culture's worth is directly related to its ability to sustain our national consciousness. Or, in the words of the flag woman, speaking to the inherent value of mass by echoing the words of Earl Lovelace, as she states, we know that what the mass was doing was fortifying a community. We know that celebration was not just mindless fun, it was community, it was creativity. Or, in the words of the Dame Lorraine, who speaks to the power of the mass to comment on the ills and foibles of society. I was born of mockery. Slaves who were parodying French plant planters poking fun at the elaborate festivals of the rich and their physical infirmities or the baby doll who wanders aloud as she likens carnival to an abandoned or neglected baby why how can you discern this your baby your carnival baby she should be nourished preserved and loved like any other child placed high on a pedestal for the world to see and experience or in the words of the tortured, desperate, depressed midnight robber who bemoans the loss and of relevance and respect that Carnival is currently facing as he proclaims, by the age of five, I was already crowned four times the king of Bacchanal. Now, by six, children couldn't name more than four characters in the Carnival. If there is no education, no carnival, and culture in the lesson, ignorance is the curse of God. Knowledge is the wing within which we fly to heaven. But hope springs eternal in the bombast and sheer enthusiasm of the black Indian. As he declares, you can't reinvent what invent. is like rediscovering Trinidad. Time come to be seen in a new light. Make it bright, bright, so bright that it blind the sight. So, all things considered, in the combined perspective of the Peregrinade, the flag woman, the Dam Lorraine, the baby doll, the midnight rubber, and the black Indian, accompanied and supported by the Pan Man, may we come to respect and recognize the inherent value of the mass traditions that define and validate us and give our carnival its unique and distinct identity as we come together to consider re-engineering the economics of carnival for sustainability. Panman, take it away.
God. And like the scholars of old, I paint with my words and my brush strokes are bold. <laughs> my father, the Pierrot, was a clown, French. Oui, oui. <laughs> and from his vault of knowledge, I grew learning in speech without need for a college. <laughs> But I am not to be confused with my French counterpart. Mm -hmm. You see, his words are a mere hobby oh. compared to my art. Oh. <laughs> my mother was Grenadian, and with her lashing tongue, I paired wit and wisdom and created Pecan. to spell, for that is my scale. Uh, what? <laughs> and for your listening pleasure, I'll now spell for your friend. Um. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, my dear listener, don't spell <laughs> letter for letter. And I'm not trying to say that my way is better. Exactly. But I have to say, and even you might agree, that letter for letter really is not a fun way to spell a word like sustainability. What? what? After all, isn't that what we come here to talk about today? Sustainability? Uh, oh! oh yes, 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 yes! Okay, that, right, that's right, the right, word right, that people right. love to throw around, mm -hmm, but true. to live by. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Not really. Mm -hmm. Yes, here in Trinbago, where old talk is the order, and the ability to sustain is always somehow suspiciously tied to sussing a dollar. Ah, tell them, tell them. We so often forget that what makes culture worthwhile is not the money it generates. Mm. Although, let's face it, money will never go out of sight. That's true. Well, 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 well. But no, culture's worth is directly related to its ability mm -hmm. to sustain our national consciousness. Mm -hmm. Sustained, though it sometimes be. Now, here I must admit to something you may not have clocked. Clock good! Hey, <laughs> But spelt for you, I have in ways that the gods of the Piero Grenade begot. Begot? What's begot? I don't know. A sussed out state, removed through word, speaking futures for you and me. That, my friends, is the way to spell sustainability. We, 
We are the main participants in the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the bourgeois then removed themselves from the Bacchanal. Yeah. Aye. It's me represent the violence of our people. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That them direct towards we. Yes, sir. The Jamets. Mm. Yes, sir. The lower class. Yes, mm. yes. Yes. It's we. As a lovelist did say, every year for years, them make sure people try to waste with them. Mm -hmm. Saying, how come them playing mass when they're hungry? Uh -uh. Mm, what? When they have no money. <laughs> what? Eh? <laughs> As if they're really concerned about we welfare. Hmm. Hmm? We take them on. We know what the mass was really doing. Mm -hmm. no, was fortifying a community. Yes. Mm -hmm. Was building up a people that them system tried to waste them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, this celebration wasn't just wasn't just money. It's funny, you know? mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. It was rebellion. Yeah. It was unity. Yeah. It was creativity. Yeah. yeah. You see me? I is woman. I is flag on my and I will point my flag and take my rightful place in every community, mm -hmm. in the city and in the middle of the carnival. Mm -hmm. Because you see, we, mm -hmm. woman, uh -uh. Yes. we have a place here too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Familiar? 
Molly Hoyty Toyty and them who just waiting for Monday and Tuesday to put on the costume. And when they put on the costume, so, and the foot touch road. Where all the behavior gone? Mm. Out the window! <laughs> Relevant than we. Who? La la. La 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 la. La 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 la. La 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 la. Sorry. 
Nowadays, by the age of one, every baby already have two pages on social media. True, true. But of course. That's true. By the age of three, while learning to walk, I trip and cause an earthquake back in Ohio. Oh, 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 oh. Nowadays, children singing along to Taylor Swift and Cardi B and don't know nothing about Calypso. Mm, nothing. Mm. At the age of five, I was already crowned four times the king of Akadal. Wow! What are you slight boy? Nowadays, by six children couldn't name more than four characters in We Carnival. Uh, we, we mm. right here. I know that at the sound of my voice, nations tremble and empires fall. But what policy is in place to ensure that future leaders even recognize my voice at all? If there is no education, no carnival, no culture in the lesson, ignorance is the curse of God, knowledge the wing wherewith we fly to heaven. I am putting it to you. Do with that information what you will. As for now, at the very least, I am a What is this job? The hardest, the meanest, the most destructive you will ever come around. Everybody's favorite carnival character. But for how long? La la. Now, I adorn these sacred garments. Showing off in this show, as our side show, on our side street, where no eyes or people meet. Hot sun, dusty, wet. Yes. Yeah. Just to get sweat. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know if I play in mass or the mass play in me. Mm -hmm. huh? mass. But you remember me, Ibo? My boy, I'm Ibo. You can't reinvent what invent. Mm. It's like rediscovering Trinidad. Mm. It's sad. It's sad. Mm. So don't construe the true intent and the beauty of my mass advent. Hmm? So it's time to see we in our new light. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's bright. 
Bright. Bright. Bright. Bright. Bright. Bright. So bright that it blind the sight. Thank you all for being here, and we are inviting our invited guests to the foyer for cocktails. Our students, you can hold back a little bit. We have something for you. So the performers also mentioned that if you'd like to take photos with them, there will be an opportunity for a photo op in the bar area. So thank you all for being here, and we hope you have a safe afternoon. Get home safely. Thank you for everyone in our online audience for joining us. Have a very good afternoon.